Welcome back to Senate Education. Act 28, uh, Literacy, Ms. St. James, if you would join us, please. Uh, I just want to remind colleagues as well as those watching, last year, two years ago, I believe, we uh, passed Act 28. Uh, and what we had heard from the field and others was uh, directly from the field, directly from teachers, that they had left undergraduate school feeling unequipped to teach reading and writing. We also looked at our test scores. We decided to uh, make some investments in literacy. And the reason I want to return to this, we had a little bit of a conversation literally the first day back. You know, I mean, this committee had just assembled. We all sat in this room. We got an update, and, and it, it was a lot at once. And uh, I wanted to sort of rewind a little bit because one of the things that I sometimes worry about that can happen in the building is, you know, from year to year, things aren't sort of continued. We don't pick up where we left off. And I don't want to lose sight of one of the most important things that we, uh, you know, work to educate kids on is how to read and write and communicate. So, Ms. St. James, we're going to start with you for just the over, overview, what the bill did, uh, and then we'll move on to Ted Fisher uh, and from the agency, and then Emily Lesh, who's the project manager for Act 28. And Emily, were you here that first day? I was. You were, yeah. yeah. And I'm sorry. I mean, it no, was just, okay. even for me, it was all, you know, uh, it was a lot. A lot so yeah. just want to sort of bring us back to it, see where we're at, see what improvements we need to do uh, to make, if any at all. So St. James. Thank you, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. <clears throat> um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the purpose and findings sections. I think Senator Campion kind of teed everyone up well for um, uh, how this act came to be. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to walk us briefly through the substance of the bill, starting on page three, section three. And I'm going to kind of summarize, uh, again, for time purposes, but if you'd like me to go back and go over the specific language in any section, please let me know. So section three essentially requires um, AOE to make certain uh, efforts using some funding that's going to be provided later on in the bill. So starting on page four, um, the agency is directed to provide professional development learning modules for teachers and methods of teaching literacy and assist supervisor unions in implementing evidence-based systems uh, wide literacy approaches to address learning loss due to COVID-19 pandemic. And there's a certain chunk of money that um, they were supposed to use for that. And then in subdivision two, AOE is also <clears throat> um, directed to use another set of funding um, that came from ARPA money um, to address learning loss through the imp implementation of evidence-based interventions that respond to students' academic, social, and emotional needs and address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on student groups most impacted by the pandemic and school districts that need additional support as evidenced by their needs assessment priorities and their COVID-19 recovery plans. And then this act directed the Agency of Education <coughs> to use some uh, additional funds um, that all the funds come in the next section. Um, to retain one or more contractors to provide technical assistance to SUs, we're on page five now, to recommend how federal funds can be used to implement Act 173 to, in the context of improving literacy outcomes, recommend evidence-based practices in teaching literacy instruction to students in pre-K through th grade three, Recommend how to provide professional development for teachers and school leaders and methods of teaching literacy. And recommend policies, procedures, and other methods to ensure that improvements in literacy outcomes are sustained. So those are things AOE <coughs> was asked to um, have a contractor provide technical assistance on. Section four on page five um, are those appropriations. So, um, 
subsection A was an appropriation um, for the cost of the contractor. The four hundred fifty thousand. Yes, the four hundred fifty thousand. Um, subsection B was uh, three million sixty thousand. Was appropriated out of ARPA funds, um, and then those were the those were the appropriations. And then page six created, section five created the Advisory Council on Literacy. And it did that by adding a statute to your green book. And we'll see later that it, it came with a, let me just verify this. It comes with a sunset. So we're adding this Advisory Council to the green books. And then it's also coming with a sunset, meaning there's a repeal built into this for June 30th, 2024. So the advisory council is created. I'm not going to go over the specific membership unless you um, feel that that's helpful. Um, but it includes uh, lots of folks you're interested in, include, uh, but also teachers and community members. Um, and then if we go on to page. Uh, eight. It automatically will sunset in 2024. If you take no action. If we take no action. Correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> page eight, um, all the way down to the bottom there, subdivision of um, subsection D are the powers and duties of the uh, council. So the council shall advise the agency of education, the state board of education, and the general assembly on how to improve proficiency outcomes in literacy for students in pre-K through grade 12 and how to sustain those outcomes. And so they are supposed to advise AOE on how to update section 2903 of this title. Um, 2903, you should have either a link to it on your website or a printout of it, is the um, reading instruction um, uh, section in the general uh, policy section of Title 16. Uh, that talks about a statewide literacy plan. So the council is supposed to update, uh, advise AOE on how to update that section. That section was added to state law in 1997, was amended in 2009, and hasn't been touched since. Implement, um, so also advise AOE on how to implement the statewide literacy plan required by 2903 and uh, whether based on its implementation changes should be made to the plan and uh, advise them on how to maintain the statewide literacy plan. The council is also supposed to advise the agency of education on what services the agency should provide to school districts, we're on page nine now, to support implementation of the plan on staffing levels and resources needed at the agency to support the statewide effort to improve literacy. To, uh, the council is supposed to advise AOE on uh, developing a plan for collecting literacy related data. Um, and you can, that informs uh, four specific criteria there. And then uh, the council is supposed to recommend uh, practices for tier one, tier two, and tier three literacy instruction within the multi tiered system of supports required under section 2902 of Title 16. Um, and uh, moving on to page 10, the council is supposed to <coughs> review literacy assessments and outcomes and provide ongoing advice as to how to continuously improve those outcomes and sustain that improvement. Subsection E requires the council to report back to the House and Senate Committees on Education, we're on page 10, with its findings and any recommendations for legislative action and this is an annual reporting requirement by December 15th of every year. Um, and then as long as they exist. As long I'm as sorry. they exist, okay. yes. Okay. Yep. Um, and then there's some information about meetings and they have the assistance of AOE and compensation. Um, page 11, there's an appropriation um, for um, expenses for the council. And then on section seven there, you'll see that's the sunset. So that's built right into the law. So section 2903A is the advisory council on literacy and it's repealed on June 30th, 2024. So that's current law. So if you don't change that, I don't believe that's changed. But if you don't change, Senator Williams. 
So have we got these reports? We're about to oh, we're, we're about to jump into some of these okay. reports right after that. Yeah. And I apologize. Good question, good point. I should have ensured that, that the sunset date has not changed. I don't remember it changing last session, but I will ensure I that it has not. I think we did change it last session, but I think it might be something we just decide possibly to move forward for forever to make sure that we have some advisory council on literacy so we don't continue to not make advances. Repealing a repeal is easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then section eight is um, some kind of input, it's implementation of the advisory council. Um, and then section 12, if we're on kind of a different topic now, I'm sorry, section nine on page 12, is teacher preparation programs. So section nine requires AOE on or before October 1st, 2022, in collaboration with the state board, uh, the standards board for professional educators to review teacher preparation programs to assess, uh, to assess what to what extent the programs prepare teacher candidates for literacy instruction, evidence-based literacy instruction. And they're supposed to also look at the licensing and relicensing criteria as it pertains to literacy instruction. And then uh, AOE and section 10 on page 12 is required to provide uh, reports to the General Assembly on December 15th, uh, uh, through this year um, on achieving the purpose of this act, which is to improve literacy outcomes for all students in the state. So theoretically, you would have one more report coming to you this coming December. Um, and then section 11 is amending part of Act 173. This is one of those um, uh, extensions that happened to some of the dates in Act 173. So it just extends the amount of uh, reports that are required from the advisory group. So uh, instead of the last report coming in 2022, the last report um, was coming in, uh, this act required it to come in January 15th, 2023. So adding a report there. Um, and then this uh, act took effect on May 13th, 2021, so not that long ago. We had a very busy, yeah, we, the, that committee was, was really worked hard on this, recognized an issue, and that's why I just don't want to lose sight of the work and the work that everybody's been doing on it. Um, so, yes, please. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. I do think there's a bill coming from the, a literacy bill coming from the House. I don't know much about it, but it may address some of the things that we just brought up. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, Turn thanks for mentioning it. And stuff like that. I, 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 the person, I can't remember who it is, caught me in the hall one day and said, yes, they're trying to take some of the findings and some of the things that, you know, sort of like you said, yeah. coming out of this and maybe creating a bill. And uh, can you say something about that? No. No. Okay. <laughs> unless okay. there's any, unless there's been a bill introduced. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. I don't have anything to add, unfortunately. So if you would just start a literacy bill for us uh, in the first thing, I think possibly that we'll put it in and we'll end up deciding what to do with it is repeal that uh, sunset date so that we always have an advisory council on this issue so we don't kind of again go back to where things were. Sure. Okay. Can you stick around a little bit? Yes. Okay, great. Mr. Fisher. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Ted Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education. I'm the agency director of communications and legislative affairs. I'm glad to be joining you for the third day in a row um, under happier circumstances today. And Ms. Lesh, great. Glad you pulled up your chair. You're, 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 it's a teat. Yes, great. and actually, I, I think um, Emily's going to do the majority of the speaking. I'm just going to sort of tee up here a little bit, and then we can dig into some of the reporting. Uh, and recommendations of the advisory council and things like that and kind of go where you would like to go Great. um but essentially uh so um just want to just briefly note we've provided written testimony under emily's name um that didn't go over the 
legislative intent, but there's three <laughs> bullets I want to briefly emphasize here, which was investing in the effectiveness and core reading instruction as critical for students in general education and students with disabilities. Students with mild to moderate um, disabilities who struggle with reading may not be supported by teachers skilled in the teaching of reading. And while some special education teachers across SUSD have a strong background in teaching and reading, others indicated they did not have the training or background to be effective in supporting students during reading. And I should also just clarify, as the chair mentioned up front, we, my, I am a poor facsimile of my colleague, direct, Jess Carolus, who is on leave at the moment, and she did come and provide you a presentation. A lot of what we're going to talk about today is duplicative of that, but our hope is that with an orientation of the bill and an opportunity to ask more questions, we can move forward there. So. Um, so our goals here um, and the goals from the bill are to improve literacy outcomes for all students in the state, um, uh, apply the ESSER funds, that's again the um, elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds under the three coronavirus um, response bills, um, to address, uh, apply those funds to address learning loss by supporting the implementation of evidence-based interventions such as summer learning, um, ELO after school with at-risk populations, and provide technical support for Vermont supervisory unions to carry out activities to address learning loss and improve literacy outcomes. So with that, um, that kind of goes over the base, the baseline of, of things. I'm going to pass the mic to Ronald. Okay. And Ms. Lesh, thanks for coming back. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And uh, floor is yours. Yeah. Happy to be here. So Emily Lesh with the Agency of Education, and I was here with Jess DeCarolis, um, my colleague. So. Much of what I mean, all of what I'm going to go through here is what she went through, and yeah. um, and we can work through it here. Um, and so, as as Ted laid out the legislative intent and legislative purpose, the act does this through establishing the um, advisory council on literacy, but then also through appropriating funds and the ESSER funds to the agency of ed and directing them towards improving literacy outcomes. And I'm going to interrupt you just for a second, if I may. Ted, have we received all of the reports that were that are now due as the agency? You are missing one. Which one? The one that you are missing is the one that the agency owes you in December 15, which is a status update. You okay. received a very short one from us uh, last January, which was due the previous December. Okay. Um, we are in, as, as the community would be aware, in a bit of a legislative reports technical debt situation that we're hoping to address over the remainder of the session and into the summer. Um, I was just hoping I was just hoping we could get a status update on when we should have that report to you, but we don't have that for the, the one that looks at how teachers are being trained in this in the state with the state colleges, UVM, all the independents. Is that somewhere? That I'm, I apologize. I have just missed. That. That's that's one I'm gonna have to look check on. Okay. I don't. I you do not have it on your website. Okay. I want to double check to see if that's the we one. We have it on our website. We have it on our website. Okay. Yeah. One is finished. So we've reported out to the advisory council on literacy on that yeah. report, and it is active on our website. Can you just send that to tell us okay. what you found in looking at the schools and colleges in Vermont? Sure. Yeah. So, um, and I will just. I'm going to find my level. notes here. Yeah, yeah, so high level. So this this report was looking at um, the so the, the title of the report is the educator um, prep preparation program yeah. literacy syllabi project. Um, and so the agency high level we worked with the education development center, which is a technical assistance um, center that serves our region. Um, and we followed and working with them, they completed the syllabi review project following national guidelines and standards that many other states, um, for instance, Massachusetts, um, followed the similar, a, a similar structure. Um, and so they were looking at a few key, two main questions, which are to what extent are evidence-based practices in reading and writing instruction represented within program syllabi from participating educator prep programs? Um, and so looking for those evidence-based practices in the syllabi, and then um, secondly, do syllabi vary in intensity and levels of practice-based opportunities associated with evidence-based practices in reading and writing instruction? Um, so all the syllabi for our state colleges and independent colleges are public? 
No. No. So, okay. yeah. Well, I... I don't um, think they are. No. Okay. I. And they're not... So what I do know, what I can say, as a result of this project, they're not public. Okay. Um, and we don't have... It's also suppressed who the... Um, who, who participated. Okay. Um, and so there were, so there are 10 educator prep programs in Vermont that okay. focus on reading and writing instruction. Six of them were reviewed um, for this project. Six participated. And, and all were given the opportunity. Or were not. Um, so I do not have that information. So one didn't respond to request. Um, and one was declined do was excluded due to design issues and then the other two didn't I'm not sure okay Just one. so you understand mm -hmm. our concern why we did it people come to this state this is their, their opportunity to learn how to teach and if they're not getting it then they're going into our schools so that's what we were trying to right get a, our handle on it sounds like we have the majority of those schools but not all so they represent 60% of educators recommended for certification in okay. early childhood, early childhood special ed and elementary pathways. Um, Just making a note that we'll figure out which programs and communicate them back to you. Well, yeah. it was suppressed due, like, with design, oh, yeah. or, like the, with the study design, I believe. I, Can we write a bill that says try again? I mean, to get everybody? You know what I mean? I mean, I'm talking, you know, but anyhow, we can get back to it. My, so, my, my thing it, it, with all this is if we had medical schools out there, you know, not training people the right way, you know, we'd all be all over it. So we just want to focus on this because we want to make sure these kids are, are really learning. So what we can do is, is get more information on the why okay. and whether or not, so the, thank you. What the, as you know, for me, the term suppress sort of triggers a, a response because usually when we use the term suppression, we we use it in reference to the federal education, uh, the Student Privacy Act, FERPA. Excuse me. Sure. Um, we can figure out whether it was an element of design, something that could be corrected, or whether or not um, there's some some legal reason why. That file Thank you. Provided. Yeah. Um. So what I'll say in the overall the strengths of this report or that it did review the syllabi and it followed this nationally recognized um, criteria for component important components and critical components of reading and writing instruction um, and so in reviewing those syllabi five of the educator prep programs so five of the six covered the ten components for evidence-based um, reading instruction and um, syllabi from three educator prep programs covered seven or more components for evidence-based writing instruction. And so this was reviewing the syllabi. As you know, in educator prep programs, we'll talk through, there's more to educator prep programs than syllabi review as well. <clears throat> So that is all on our website, and we can make sure to link you to that. Today. So that my report. question is, are we in good shape, or have we got some problems? Did I miss that? Around how, whether or not our schools are doing this well. Is that, is that I mean, seven out of the 10, six, you know, the 10 out of the 10. Yeah, What's your so professional five, assessment? Should we um, be? I'm not, I, um, I'm looking at Ted here because I'm not, a, I, I don't think it's an area where it's not an area that we have that I can comment on okay. right now. Okay, that's fair. And I don't mean to put any extra. Yeah, on no, I, I, I think it's, back and, say, hey, that's not it's really um, and I think, so there are some next steps and recommended next right. steps. Right. Um, and actually I'll just, let's, let's get into those right now. Um, because that I, I think will help. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just note that I'm, um, I'm uh, sending this link to Hayden to include as an as an exhibit, and I apologize for the oversight on that. Um, the conclusions, the conclusions from the report is three three. Just making sure I've got the right one here. Yeah. Um, it's three paragraphs, so I could read it really quickly. Nice. Okay. Um, the 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 through line seems to be that educators 
including Vermont CPP programs are exposed to evidence-based practices for reading and writing instruction. Yeah. But we'll provide a full report for you. Yeah. Um, so the initial recommendation, so one is to align content of the results-oriented program approval, so it's the ROPA approval process, um, performance-based approach to evidence-based reading and writing practices. Um, oh, so we are on the final page of the written testimony, page seven. Yeah. Um, so, and that the, the ROPA process is not an area of, of expertise for myself, but within the agency, we can certainly get you additional information on that process. Um, bottom of page six. Oh, sorry, bottom of page six. Um, so the second recommendation is reviewing the educator prep program courses to learn about pre-service teacher opportunities to apply what they learn in courses, practice skills, and receive explicit feedback on the application of those skills that they've learned. Um, the third one is developing and delivering professional development to educator prep programs to ensure pre-service teachers have opportunities in classroom settings with students to apply practice and receive feedback on evidence-based reading and writing instructional practices. Um, and the fourth one is to develop and deliver professional development for districts in writing, focusing specifically on areas least reflected in the course syllabi. And so that, that fourth recommendation is based on the fact that the review of the writing syllabi were poorer than the, the reading. Um, so those, those are the recommendations from the syllabi project. Okay, so should we go through the rest of this? Please. Okay, um, so the so as we walked through earlier, there were four key areas for um, work within the agency of Ed, and the first is the use of federal funds, and so um, so. Within that, so now we're on page, I'm on page two. Um, there's the staffing and organizational focus, um, really focused on building capacity within the agency of ed. Um, and so we've done that in two critical ways. So one is that I am on board as the Act 28 project manager. Um, and so I started in June. The second big thing is really, um, starting in September of 2021, a cross-divisional interdisciplinary team has been working in the agency and that's been really critical for overall coordination across the agency on literacy efforts um, overall. The second big piece of work that has happened around using the federal funds to, act, to implement um, Act 173 of 2018 um, is focused on the communications and stakeholder engagement. And so um, that we have ongoing communication with our Literacy Council Chair, um, Chair Gwen Carmali, who I believe you're hearing from on, on tomorrow, is already Friday. Mm -hmm. um, um, a constant communication, communication with membership organizations. Um, we're continuing to expand um, network improvement communities um, and providing technical assistance um, to to the um, local to the LEAs. Um, Emily, can I ask? You yeah, please. Um, just thinking of technical assistance, are those um, webinar PD pods? I can't remember for the yeah. term, but are they up and running now? So they are not up and running okay. yet, and we are in the final stages of contracting okay. and procurement. Yeah. What, what's what, what do you like? What's the timeline? Do you think a month or two? Um, it mm -hmm. is. Yeah. So I'll have to get back to you on the specifics. Just I'll just note. Um, not 
just related to this, the process of IT contracting. I'm not sure why, and it's it extends, I think, beyond our agency. The process of IT contracting has become more lengthy. Mm -hmm. So many projects that we are have ongoing, mm -hmm. including replacement of our educator licensing system. I, I, like, I believe it was not this committee, but another, but the uh, Midland House Education, your colleagues in the House heard concern about our education licensing system, sort of our IT system being frankly outdated. Yeah. Um, it's, it, the contracting process takes a long time right. to do and to work through the many steps um, related to information technology. So we can try to provide an update. I think we've observed, and correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, we've observed that this process has taken longer than anticipated, mm -hmm. even post passage of, of the legislation. Okay. So. Yeah, just, I mean, it'd be, once it's up and running, it'd be great to take a look at it. Yeah, it's amazing. exciting. Yeah. We would love to come show it to you. Um, certainly one of the things, too, I think, I'm not 100% sure I want to double check myself and follow up with the committee, but, you know, these are learning modules. So mm -hmm. our hope yeah. is that we'll find a solution that will work for other learning modules across the agency. Great. I've yeah. Fingers are crossed. But they're more pods, yeah. So, um, man, oh, sorry, go. No, you follow up. Okay, then, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then this is another question that's tangentially related, maybe. But um, when I was on the advisory literacy committee, um, I was, I loved it. That's great work. One thing that I, that made me a little disappointed was that, um, and I get it, but that we weren't allowed in any way to make any recommendations around um, curricula or um, uh, lesson plan companies products which i understand we don't want to like give a you know a leg up to some mm. um, companies or some products and not others at the same time you know we want to have a little bit more centrality in our systems and i know like in burlington we ended up buying a program that we're going to be using across the whole district because it's part of our strategic plan now um it just i guess I would have liked some kind of guidance from the experts, like these products are really good, mm -hmm. these are maybe not so good, you know, just some kind of guidance and help in that regard. Um, can, can I just yeah. ask a clarifying question? Yes. Do you, do you mean not recommending to school districts what they should contract for or recommending to the agency what it should contract for? Um, I, as a district, I was looking for assistance gotcha. as someone who's you know trying to help my district it would have been nice to have some kind of i don't know guidance or maybe even just like a rating system or um yeah. you know that just would be because i mean i'm sure they're not all equal i'm sure some are better than others and um anyway this is a suggestion maybe so following up on senator julik's question about the 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 pods and the modules. So you are right now working to create these, and these modules will be videos that teachers can watch to learn how to, again, teach reading and writing. So they will be, yes, and they are the, so they'll be modules that, <clears throat> that really focus on the neurological underpinnings of literacy acquisition. Um, right. and, and so there will be, they'll be stackable and asynchronous so teachers can engage in them um, as they're able to online. Um, and it is a part of this larger um, IT contracting process as Ted said. And so that IT hosting of that um, is a part of um, and just the, that complexity of this contract. So to Senator Gulick's other point, it sounds like there's already technology out there that does some of this stuff, right? I don't know a I ton mean, about it, but I know like we have, you know, we purchased a, um, and I don't know the name of it, but a yeah. product to help assist with literacy in our district. I think we're talking about two different two things. things. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. we're talking. You're uh, so we're talking oh, yeah, about we professional development right. modules yeah. that teachers will be able to engage in around the five uh, critical okay. components of literacy curriculum. The reading, writing. Yeah. Got it. 
I'll just so I'll just note yes just a small um, clarification um, these the part of the reason why this is more complex from the IT perspective is that we're creating something um, more in depth it's a, really a whole on, online course rather than just a video my now many members of our agency create these very long and in depth and well well constructed um, uh, presentations that we put on YouTube and despite the fact that it makes me personally a little bit worried because they are difficult from a digital accessibility perspective we have to do a lot of work to make them accessible they're wonderful resources that we can relatively easily provide and do in-house the thing about that is that you can watch them at your own time but they're not linked back to things like um, professional development assessment the kind of things that are necessary for teachers to complete professional learning so we're talking about creating essentially an online coursework that teachers can complete and then my understanding is we use as part of their, their ongoing professional learning requirements. Um, so that's why it's a little bit more complex and that is part of the reason why it's taking longer. And we're also, it was, so it was put out to bid. And so we put it out to bid and have, there were several national groups that bid on doing this work. So bringing that expertise to, to the work. So Ms. Lash, if somebody were to ask me, all right, so what's happened since the bill itself passed in terms of training teachers nothing yet is that accurate so there are there are uh, there are several things that have happened okay. around training teachers. Training teachers. so let's get, okay. In, let's, okay. That'd be let's great. get into that Thank you. that's great and I can't wait to come in and tell you about I these modules be being yep. live and ready to go and um, helping spread the word great. amongst your constituencies um, okay so um, the so one big piece of work that has also happened um, is around evidence-based practices for literacy instruction. And so we have recommended evidence-based practices through a series of guiding documents um, based on national research. Um, we have included a lot of um, briefs to make it easier for teachers to break down and, and make sense of these longer um, documents around classroom practices. Um, we have, with the special education team, um, has developed reading and writing checklist um, to really help um, guide and document that students have received appropriate instruction and intervention. Um, and then one piece that we're working really closely with right now with Ted's team, the, the communications team, is creating an evergreen web space to really support um, the ability of teachers and system leaders to find parents to be able to find um, evidence-based practices in one central spot on our website um, to just make it easy easier to navigate towards. For, for parents, did you say? Uh, and including parents, yep. So thinking about all the, the yeah. stakeholders um, within a, a school. Um, so so that's, that's a big, so right now those documents are live on our website and we're working on pulling them together in a more consolidated way and also adding more to that. Um, <clears throat> the other piece that we're working on um, that I find really, that is really exciting is we're collaborating with this Region 1 Comprehensive Center um, a, who is providing some technical assistance and support um, to us as well to develop a, um, a literacy blueprint playbook, so a, which will be a stackable resource for system leaders um, that are that will help them put the statewide literacy plan or literacy blueprint into practice. Um, and that will focus on the evidence-based and data, um, data-based decision-making. Um, and in order to do that, we just completed a, and a survey to understand the district level needs and supports to improve literacy outcomes. And we had 82% of um, supervisor unions and districts respond to that, and so we're and we're working on um, we're we're working on gathering responses from the 8% that didn't respond. But it's a very actionable number that we have, and we have um, it provides a lot of depth and insight around what is happening across the state, and so we're 
actively analyzing that, and that will provide us a really good foundation of information um, so that the professional development and the evidence-based resources and this evergreen web space that we're talking about here will be really responsive to the needs of, of districts across the state, and that's the intent there. So um, I think that, that, that um, just this process of gathering the information and understanding to make informed um, and strategic choices about how we, how we move forward is important. Um, so other professional develop, I know you asked specifically about professional development. I am going to, I'm going to jump over here to page, I'm using a slightly uh, edited document. So I think it's page five, the in-service professional learning. So the literacy professional development, we talked about- Bottom of page five. Bottom of page five. We talked about the pre-service learning and the educator prep program syllabi mm -hmm. project. And now we'll focus on this, the other in-service professional learning that's happening. Um, so we already hit on that first bullet, which is about the, the modules, the self-paced online learning modules that'll cover the five areas of um, literacy instruction. Um, <clears throat> there also are Vermont Early Learning Standards um, training modules that are developed that will be hosted on an online platform. Um, and then we're in a active, um, the, we're in the final process of selecting a vendor who will provide professional development and training around family engagement and literacy. Um, and so this is also a really exciting development and I can okay. say with, hopefully I should, uh, that say, this, will, say this will roll out by, um, by this summer. So this okay. will be professional development really targeting this summer as an important time. Um, Senator Buell. Yeah. I just want to jump in there. Um, I'm not sure everyone in the committee knows, and I only know this because I was a teacher, but that there, a lot of times in the summer, there's a real downturn in um, reading ability or um, reading levels because kids are out for, you know, two and a half months. And so it's really important to have those tools um, and resources in the summer to keep those levels up, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's yeah. a great point. And Senator Williams has a bill about, would you say yesterday, year long school? <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> we should... Didn't we talk no. about this? No, just in the school in the summer. Season, right. right, right, right. Yep. Yeah. 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 We just talked about just talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off the road. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, this work around the family engagement and literacy and the professional development, it will be twofold. So, we, it will have, there'll be literacy family engagement workshops. Um, so, engaging families in, in literacy and then also small group supplemental literacy instruction that will be aligned with those workshops. And so, um, that, that will be soon Great. forthcoming as well. Um, the other piece that is really exciting and that's very active is that we're a part of work with the Chief Council State I'm always, Council of Chief State School Officers. Thanks, Dad. No. I mean, there, is, Steve, yeah. there is no common term for Secretary of Education sure. in, in the country, so that is the professional association for all of the state education agencies. And they are doing this work called a network improvement community, and so through that work, um, there's job embedded coaching that several of our districts are participating in. And so there's active professional development and coaching happening there. Um, and they're working directly with um, a nationally recognized um, researcher, Dr. Sharon Wal Walpole. Um, and so that is really focused on collaborative professional learning. Um, they go through plan, study, do, act cycles. And so they're um, they're actively, the teachers are actively coming together, trying out what they're learning, coming back, sharing what's working and what's not. Um, and so that, that is a profession that's currently happening right now. Um, I can't, I just can't to break in having participated in, in some meetings related to another network to improve the community. This is something that we do sort of across our portfolio. Can't emphasize how, enough how amazing CCSSO is as a resource. As a matter of fact, CCSO is always part of the reason why you heard from um, Mario Carreño earlier on school construction, because we were able to reach out to our Rhode Island contacts um, to hear about it. Yeah. 
care about their program of the request of housing. Thank so you. Just want to say. Yeah. So I, I just had a general question. Um, you know, what what are what do teachers think uh, about these uh, programs, and you know, do, do they, have they shared any thoughts on it in general, or is that a very broad question? That's a great question. It is a great question. That's a very broad question. Yeah. Um, speaking generally, one of the things, just not related to literacy. Um, one of the things I would love us to be better about as an agency is understanding what the needs are from all, almost all of our target audiences, frankly. And, and you hear me slide into communications directors speak, right? One, teachers are one group of, of, of folks among parents and students and that, we, that we talk to. Um, I do not know that we have surveyed them on literacy. We have not teachers specifically. We have not surveyed them nope. specifically. Yeah. Um, but it's something that we'd like to do more of, just more generally than just literacy. Um, I think Senator Hutchins' question is a great one. Yeah, and hopefully you can take that back and just yeah, think about that. It's huge, right? I, mean, I also think as we're, it's a really important question as there are many opportunities coming up um, around professional development, and so really ensuring and that communication and ability to access these opportunities, um, but also that it's it's done in a, a coordinated fashion. Well, I hope one thing a blueprint does is just send the message that we really need to improve our literacy skills in the state and that there are a lot of folks who are behind it. And, um, you know, because sometimes it's all about uh, messaging and getting people excited. To, it was going to be work, right? For some people to learn a new way to teach reading, it's going to be work and it's going to take time and resources. But if if there's just this collective sense that this is a priority for everybody, I think that that's helpful. So hopefully that's one of the messages that will come through with the blueprint and when we really start pushing it in as best we can. I do want to just note because the uh, to orient to the two to the two reports from the advisory council. So this year's report was um, recommendations to update the blueprint. Last year's report was recommendations on the section. I'm so sorry, Beth. I'm forgetting which section it is. Two nine zero three, um, which is the section of, of law on literacy and reading instruction that hasn't been updated since '09. Um, the recommendations are for that from the advisory council are contained in last year's report, which you can find on the committee website, and I can provide to Aiden for just for convenience. I just checked with Emily beforehand. The agency is not prepared to comment on their recommendations today, but it's something if you're interested in taking those up that we can certainly come back and talk to you about. Thanks much. So I think we're getting yeah. close to it here. So um, I did note earlier these, this, um, or, continuing this collaboration with the Region 1 Comprehensive um, Center, really focused on developing this playbook um, and then also developing a statewide community of practice for lit literacy educators. And so that actually, I think that gets to this question of, of teachers a bit. And so that will be an opportunity for educators across the state to engage um, and, and engage with one another. Um, and then the, that one other piece to note that we will be, there will be shortly, I'm hoping within the next two months, um, six weeks I have in my notes here, um, as there will be a request for proposals put out for a statewide model um, coordinated curriculum for English language arts and literacy. And so that gets to your point here of providing, um, it, it will not be a, a list, but it will be a, a, um, a statewide a model for coordinated curriculum. And so that will be putting that out to bid, and so we'll get responses and then um, work oh, from there to select that. someone. So that's yeah. another piece. Nice. Ms. Lesh, I'm very glad you left Kentucky. <laughs> How did you find That is a little known fact. Oh, really? That I'm from, I grew up in, yeah, I grew up in Kentucky. Well, I, I'm oh. very happy that you're here doing this work. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need it. Very happy to be here. If you'll, uh, Senator Weeks. No, just, a, just a curiosity question. It looks like the bulk of uh, the act was to fund um, uh, 
journey mod professional development modules, which seem to have uh, equated to online online training. I'm just curious from the agency's perspective on the um, reception. It goes back to a question that uh, Senator Gulick asked. Is, is this the best uh, vehicle for for improving, enhancing teachers' uh, literacy? Do you mean the technology or the... Yeah, the one, one format versus another. You know, we, we've all done a lot of online training. And one thing we noticed, um, I believe that, it, is it for Ms. Lesh or is it for anybody? Well, I'm not sure who, okay. who to address it best. I one, can, I'll fill in. One thing okay. we noticed um, when the pandemic happened and we had to start doing almost all of our technical systems and professional learning online is that we started to see a much better representation from around the state from a geographic perspective when we're either holding things in Montpelier or a lot of times we'd be convening things, trying to convene things in regional centers or a lot of professional learning for educators is convened, unfortunately, in Chittenden County, um, with some, some in Washington County. Um, so certainly the ability to provide um, online options at the very least is, is something we really like. Um, the other thing about these modules is they will be self-paced and asynchronous. So you can take them this year, you can take them next year, you can take them when you wish, rather than having to try to schedule on an in-service day or try to do it in the summer or find a time or maybe miss an opportunity because your district's schedule doesn't align with it or, or what have you. So there are plenty of those options still out there, but that's one major benefit to having them be online. Okay, and maybe from a, I don't know if you, if you, uh kind of watch national trends, but uh, nationally, are we seeing that these are effective uh, um, uh, professional enhancement yeah. uh, products? I mean, is it having a net result is really, I, I know it's too early for this program, but yeah. from a national perspective. Yeah, I think, so I don't have specific data on the national results, but I think the trend that we're seeing nationally and even like Rhode Island, the folks that were just in here talking, they, have taken a really similar approach where it's one part of professional development overall. And so I think that that's the way that we're, the lens that we're using as well is like, this is one piece of it that is an important piece and it's a way to, um, to with the, <clears throat> the limitations of, of traveling for in-person sessions, um, it's an opportunity that teachers will be able to plug into on their time and when works for them but also being really mindful of the need to complement that with other offerings as well. And so that is one piece of the developing this community of practice that we talked about for lit literacy educators, um, whether that's a monthly getting together and being able to debrief with, with others. Um, and so thinking about how we can use those modules as a platform for doing other work in professional development as well and in other conversations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but I think it's an important question. Concluding comments from you? We're, we have uh, about 30 minutes on Act 1 and then 30 minutes on PE. Yes, you've yeah. got a packed afternoon here. Yeah. I, I, we have made it through a lot of information here. I just want to say something generally, which is that if you go um, to uh, page two, middle of the page, where it talks about staffing organization, um, that Emily spoke about it earlier. I just, I just wanna note that one of the things that the agency does often, that a position was created, or actually a, a contractor um, provision was created that ended up in the hiring of a limited service position in, in, in Emily. Um, and it takes much more than just one position often. The agency, you, yeah, you've heard Secretary French sort of refer to this either in passing um, or more specifically, is that we, when we um, have, when we identify needs or when the legislature um, makes laws, we reorganize ourselves often to meet those needs. And so the, you, you know, you're seeing the, the, your work here, but you're also seeing how we organize through, you know, through a lot of, a lot of information, how we weave it together with existing, um, uh, uh, opportunity or existing programs find additional opportunities and try to create something that is as comprehensive as possible. So I just wanted to signal that and, and draw that that out there. Um, but it, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of collaboration internal and with partners and we try to make sure it's aligned with all of the other work that we're doing. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Yeah.
Thanks very thank much. You. Really thank appreciate you. it. I, I just this is very helpful. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. Yeah. And good work for you. Good work on yeah, this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Committee, just, just you to take three minutes, then we're going to do thirty minutes on Act One and thirty minutes on Physical Education. And welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, Ms. Garces, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. you have the floor, uh, and I know you have, uh, of course, we we're, we know Ms. Myers from her work, uh, but we don't know, am I pronouncing it correctly? It's just Soria? Soria. Soria, yeah. thank you. Uh, the floor is yours, and, and tell us a little bit about Act One. This is a completely new group of people for the Senate. Um, and so they're all curious about Act One and its implementation. Great. Great. And we have until four when the physical educators are going. Okay. Right. We tell the teachers um, about support. Yeah. Okay. So we'll rush so, it. Um, yeah, don't rush it. We can always have you back. It's always, yeah. Thank you. For the record, my name is Amanda Garces. I'm the Director of Policy, Education, and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission and the chair of the Act One Working Group. And yeah, I'm Chelsea Myers. I'm the Associate Executive Director at the Vermont Superintendents Association, and I'm here in my capacity as a representative on the Act One Working Group for its entire duration. Uh, I'm Diego Soria. I'm a junior at Montpelier High School, and I'm mentoring Amanda as well as Act One. Great. He's the, the, and the it's nice to have a student here. So, um, we'll start by just giving you a background of why Act 1 exists. Um, Would it be helpful to tell you when we're switching slides if it's not up here? Uh, sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. We're on the Remembering the Why 1999 slide. Did you want to bring it up? It's up to you. It's okay if you have it. Okay, we have it right here. So, um, so just to give a background of why Act One exists, in 1999, uh, the advisory committee in the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights published a report that said that racism in Vermont school was pervasive. Um, they did a follow-up report in 2003 that said some changes were made, but it's still not a priority among school administrators, school boards, elected officials, state agencies, charged with civil rights enforcement. Um, in 2017, the Act, 1, Act 54 report, Racial Disparities in State Systems, uh, was issued by the Human Rights Commission's and the Attorney General's Office uh, Task Force concluded that education was one of the five state systems in which racial disparities persisted and needed to be addressed and as a recommendation, they said that we need to change the, the culture a little bit and also to, to teach children from an integrated curriculum um, that represented both the contributions of people of color as well as indigenous people, women, people with disabilities, and fairly accurately represented our history and oppression of these groups. Um, Are you all familiar with the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey? Um, that provides some pretty valuable data about how our kids are doing. And in 2019, uh, the report found um, pretty startling information about LGBTQIA youth in our state. Um, for example, twice as likely to be have been bullied, uh, 3.5 times as likely to have experienced, experienced unwanted sexual contact, um, and 4.5 times as likely to have attempted suicide in the last 12 months. So pretty startling data. And so uh, Act 1, um, so Act 1 was the result of a lot of advocates that came together. Uh, so if you think 1990 report, things of the grandmas now, that were the parents of some of the kids in the school. So these are, it, it was brought in, it was created and written by a group of grassroots activists who came from BIPOC communities, LGBT communities, and people with disabilities, um, and disability justice advocates. And really to center the inclusion that was culturally responsive, anti-racist, anti-discrimination. And um, in 2019, this legislature signed um, Act 1 into law. Mm -hmm. 
So the Act 1 working group consists of state leaders in education, high school students, civil society advocates, and community members uh, who care deeply about uh, the causes of Act 1. Um, I'll say from personal experience, it's been one of the most rewarding um, professional experiences that I've had at BSA. Just a lot of hours, I, I mean a lot of hours spent, um, unfortunately, in Zoom rooms, um, but building relationships, really diving into the language and thinking about what's best for all kids um, has been a great experience with all the other associate, uh, education associations as well as members from the community. So the working group is 23 members, four students. Uh, we have indigenous representatives from the indigenous community, the Abenaki. We have all the VBA, all the Vs, as they're mm -hmm. called, often in these rooms, curriculum directors associations, NEA, my office, which is the Human Rights Commission, uh, the Office of Racial Equity, plus the rest are community members adopted, uh, appointed by the Education Justice Coalition is a grassroots organization that does education justice in Vermont. Um, so there's all these community members who are advocates in different avenues from disability rights to LGBTQ rights to black and brown um, families. So for the past three years, we focus our charge on the education quality standards. That's uh, basically mm -hmm. what we put in. We see as the floor of our work. Yeah, so for those who don't know, the education quality standards are a governmental rule from the State Board of Education, um, and it's really kind of like a blueprint of edu for education in the state of Vermont. It's looking at what's important for schools to teach in terms of values, objectives, and aspirations, as well as, again, that blueprint on guiding districts as they develop curriculum in their local system. So I'm sure you've all heard that curriculum is adopted, is created and adopted locally. So this is not a curriculum document, but instead kind of a blueprint guiding document for the state. And so when we edited the proposed changes in the EQS, we really focused on changes to direct instruction, curriculum, um, not curriculum itself, but like how curriculum is um, produced and led at the local level, uh, expanded anti-discrimination protections, professional development of school staff, flexible pathways to learning. That was a big one, um, just really thinking about who's accessing flexible pathways and what are the barriers of access to flexible pathways. Um, school board policies and administrative leadership, school community collaboration, and that was really a focus of like what our school board's doing to connect with the community, what policies are in place, that sort of work, um, and restorative justice practices. And so the in revising, we have kind of this overall thinking, which is our charge, or like how does a document like this promote critical thinking around the histories and contributions and viewpoints, encourages students to really explore questions of ethnic and social identities, uh, provide welcome spaces for all of our students, and develop pathways for families to really be able to talk about a child's experience related to race, ethnic, or social group identity at school. The statement of purpose basically is what is guiding everything. And it's saying that the, the underline is our additions to the statement of purpose of the current EQS, um, which is that schools need to be equitable, anti-racist, culturally responsive, anti-discriminatory, and inclusive. And we add that it should also include independent schools. Uh, some of the ways that Act 1 wants to support students is creating spaces that improve student well-being. I do a lot of, uh, I guess, listening to a lot of the marginalized groups in our schools, like kids from who have a Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan background, uh, Armenia, uh, South America, like a lot of different groups. And one of the one of the big things that many of them talk about is not being able to feel supported in curriculum. They, they feel supported by each other like through culture and through like food and stuff like that but we we one of the common struggles that we talk about is not being able to 
have any influence on the curriculum. And so, yeah. And that um, it is for all students. So you'll see a lot of slides. We're not going to read all of them. But to give you a snapshot of kind of like the work, how we're thinking about students living in poverty, um, that how do we um, ask that to recognize and reduce any financial barriers to access of flexible pathways, further in economic justice by asking schools to teach about and help students understand why everyone should have economic opportunities. Um, and then you want to talk a little more about? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so really supporting BIPOC students in, in Vermont, I feel is very important because my own experiences moving here from Arizona, which is a very diverse place and coming here, I felt very um, kind of alone and not supported, not being able to express things like, um, now I can't share like foods with other people. And that's a very isolating feeling. And to know that there's people who are working on uh, creating a more welcoming space in schools here makes Makes not only me feel good, but as well as my peers at the high school, and I'm sure in other high schools. Yeah, um, just as Amanda mentioned, this, we think that the edits are inclusive of all students, and we particularly looked at how the education quality standards can support our LGBTQIA plus youth, um, especially with the national narrative going on now, just really doubling down on anti-discrimination, equity, and inclusion for those students, um, and thinking about the language particularly around that. And then um, the we also thought about students with disabilities and how the education quality standards aligns with our other like federal protections, Act 173, which you heard yesterday. We, may, we were really thinking about how can we reinforce and support the other laws on the books that are supporting students with disabilities um, and making, uh, of course, inclusive language. So for an example, we added some language about accessible print and multimedia that wasn't um, in the document before. For multilingual students, you know, being able to communicate to parents and legal guardians about opportunities for flexible pathways in ways that are cultural and linguistically inclusive. Um, we talked a lot, spent a lot of time about thinking through multilingual families, like my family, and how like that affects uh, me growing up. When I came when I was 16, I have, you know, my mom never had anything translated. We were in Vermont, but you know, like thinking through all of those experiences of how do we really support families who English is second language, whose kids sometimes end up translating for their parents or like their caregivers what they need. So I think, you know, we really um, had a lot of conversations around being multilingual and about those services that students can, can get and how they get information in their different languages. Oh, yeah. So at one of our first meetings, um, we really talked about where this work situates in the context of kind of the education guiding frameworks of, in Vermont. So I talked about the education quality standards, which is kind of that overarching blueprint of education. But when we think about ethnic, ethnic and social equity standards, um, we thought about, and that diagram is from the Vermont Agency of Education, should that be another standalone type course, for example? Um, so you have math and literacy and science standards and global citizenship standards. Should it sit beside it and be another category? Um, or should it, in the next slide, be situated on top and be a lens in which all the other subject areas are um, viewed through? And so as a working group, we really thought about that second option of that lens from which all the other standards are viewed through. Hi, uh, just a quick question. Uh, the CCSS, NGSS, C3, uh, yeah, sorry, what, what yeah, is it? Sorry. 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 So um, C3 is the like social studies standards that are generally adopted um, at the local level. 
the next gen science standards are a national set of standards that are generally adopted at the local level. Um, and then I actually don't know That's what the acronyms right? are for it's the for which one? literacy That's and math. English language arts. Yeah. The CCSS. Oh, Common Core. I'm sorry. Common Core, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And these are adopted by the State Board of Education, right? Like the, the State Board, these are the academic standards that have been adopted by them. And our job was to look at these standards to, to make sure that they were relevant to all of the communities. Um, so that, that was a decision, we, our first decision, January 2019 or 20. Uh, it was like, are we gonna do our work as a standalone, or do we? Is it something that is going to be adopted with everything? So all of the content standards like are our view. So we finished our education quality standards in April. We submitted. We got a lot of feedback from a lot of people. We submitted to uh, the State Board of Education, and since then they created a subcommittee that's been looking at this document. Um, and it's about to go into rulemaking process in a few months uh, where the state board will look at it. They, the subcommittees got some public comments, they've made some changes. We kind of been collaborating back and forth with the action working group to ensure that it's alignment or that they understand the whole context. And so hopefully in the, ne in the next few months, they will be voting on it. Uh, the rulemaking process will go through and the state will adopt that. As part of our last work, uh, what we're working on right now, do you want to talk about that? Do you want to talk about the policies first? Sure. Oh, yeah. We also formed a policy subcommittee group um, that will be looking at, are there any policies that are maybe missing from required policies or model policies at VSBA that could help support this work, especially like around the school board function of the changes that we're asking for. Um, so we haven't gotten very far into that work, but that is kind of another stage in the final stages of the work, the working group. So we'll be done June 30th. By then we will have a set of recommendations around policies that will crosswalk with anything that we're making. And we, uh, the legislature approved $50,000 in the last, uh, last year to support our work with a consultant. So we um, failed three attempts of the simplified bid for Rico's proposal, but now we have an amazing team of consultants who are ethnic studies experts who are helping us build an ethnic studies framework. So there's a subcommittee that was created um, that is meeting every week for like three hours uh, and like diving deep and then, you know, we'll be done with hopefully that by May um, and we will close shop in June. So in your last few slides, um, is just we just wanted to give you what a framework looks like and there's some examples in there new york state education department has a framework that they use washington state and and so that's kind of what we are going to be building for vermont is a framework that then will be used um, hopefully as with all the content standards so when they're looking at math you know, there will be components that, you know, teachers when they're building their curriculum will be thinking about to meet those standards. So that's kind of, I won't go in through that. Uh, those last slides were created by our friend Michael Martin, yeah. who's the Curriculum Directors Association rep. Um, but yeah, so I know we only have 10 minutes, so if you have questions for us. Okay. I'll really quickly add, uh, Amanda Mike uh, McGrath from the Vermont Principals Association and I have been doing quite a bit of traveling around the state, uh, talking to different stakeholders about what they think they're gonna need for implementation and really just getting the word out there at different opportunities and having discussions about like what's the fear and like really building on the fact that a lot of this work is already happening and uplifting it and thinking about it from a system-wide perspective. So that's just starting, but I think it's been really um, rewarding experience and we'll need more of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, so what's sort of a before and after, if you will? What does education look like before this is implemented? And what does it look like after? Is it the lens itself, how we're looking through? Can you just say something about that? 
constituent were to say, hey, just give me the quick skinny on this, what's, what is it? I think we could start if it's okay with a story as an example of like where the story about your classroom experience and what that looks like could potentially be the type of experience that students are hopefully going to experience statewide. That'd be great. Um, so I had an English teacher in my sophomore year who I made a really good connection with. We, we made, we just like really connected deeply. Yeah. And I asked him about one day what he thought about the topic um, when in the English language, a lot of people, when they say America, it's specifically talking about the United States, but America in itself is not just the U.S., but it's South America, the United States, Mexico, Canada. It's that whole part. And there's a song um, that was pretty, uh, that went pretty viral, and it's called This Is Not America. and it has a lot of just like the artist is kind of just showing like all of the, the the latino side of things and how it impacts the united states and how just the the latino experience feeling like kind of like quiet quieted down i guess and he offered that it was a great opportunity for his class so i helped him teach uh the class one day with that song and i analyzed it with the class and made those connections so i think with that question like just kind of incorporating all those things to like give kids a more open view of yeah, perspective. Yeah. Yeah, so I hear voice and choice, sense of belonging, cultural representation in the curriculum, um, student driven content. I think it's like the perfect embodiment of what we're hoping for across classrooms. And what we do here is that this document is in some ways in Vermont, you know, the, the practice is ahead of the document, right? Like there are some exactly. educators like that said. are already yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's really important for us to like really, that what you're doing with it, what we're doing with this is really supporting those educators that are really doing this work, that are trying and attempting to have um, like the students be, uh, all students have like find that their way, so. Finding that just helps your education, I suspect. So, I mean, we all have to find those passions, those interests, and if we're not feeling recognized, then that's hard. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is so important, um, and I can't help but, as we just were talking about school construction, as I'm thinking, mm -hmm. How are we going to build culturally responsive schools, the physical structure, when the time comes? So I'm really excited about that. Um, but I also just wanted to say, um, you know, this work is so critical, um, not only for our BIPOC students to be able to see themselves in the classroom and in the curriculum, but for, for you know, for me, um, growing up in Vermont, um, I, there's so much I didn't learn. Um, and I've had to kind of recoup it as an adult. Um, and I often feel a little bit sort of angry about how narrow my education was. Um, so I'm really hoping that this expands what we learn in terms of lived histories and you know the, the, the truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, the whole kit and caboodle of um, complex histories and um, so I really appreciate this. Thank you very much and thanks for coming after school. I'm sure that was, I'm sure you're exhausted, but thank you for being here. I ran here for coming after school. Okay. Senator Hashim. I just wanted to say, um, you know, this, so Act 1 was actually the very first bill that I voted on in the House and the House, because they're so wonderful, uh, wanted, <laughs> wanted to make sure that this was at the top of the priority list and and I remember after voting, I was like, I wonder what this is going to look like in two or three years. So it's really wonderful to see the work you're doing. Um, and you know, at least at least for my district, I, I can't remember the numbers, but I know Wyndham County is one of the fastest changing when it comes to demographics. And you know, I, I think this is setting a good stage for our students and, you know, and, and adults across the state. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Thanks. So we do have four recommendations for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so we, we um, 
just oh, great. <laughs> um, encouraging the state board to adopt the recommended changes yeah. for formal rulemaking um, would be helpful. Um, and then considering the work, this work, and you know the principles of this work when working on any new instructional initiatives or any initiatives in general. Um, the example is like school construction, for yeah. you know, and Winooski School District is a great example of how school design can be really critical for communities. Um, and then explore, um, I think, talking with the Agency of Education on the implementation of this work and what the plan is, because I think that teachers are gonna need to feel really supported um, in this. It can be really scary in some communities to implement this, um, and we just wanna make sure that we're bolstering that support as much as possible. And I, and I think with the new instructional initiatives, I think it's really important um, as we're building this framework too, that we're really connecting all the pieces, I think that when we think of ethnic studies, it's like, okay, like there's a class, it's like, no, like this framework is really going to be impacting a lot of things. And, you know, we we have really amazing experts that are helping us build this, and we just don't want it to be like, okay, they created that and it's gonna be on the shelf. It's like, how does it really connect with everything uh, as a lens for all of our students? And I wanna emphasize that we really mean it when we say all of our students, like when, like really deeply every working group member really believes that this is not just for our BIPOC students but that all of our students will benefit so and and how we see that capacity being built for like something is that the practices already happen and we have really amazing educators and uh, doing really good work and that we should also support them and like we were like thinking like this mentorship idea like how do we they who have already yeah. doing, who are connected, who really have it down to support others that really want to do it but don't know what the kind of questions they ask. Because that's really the most important question. It's like, they're afraid because they don't know, because we didn't learn these things, because there is a lot of work that we're going to have to do deeply um, to think about like how our position and how we implement this space. So that we really support them but that we support them as a team, that it's not just one teacher, but that like, here, we're gonna pay you so that we can help create some units that other ones can learn. And so I think there's really great educators and I, I just wanna lift them up because this work is possible because of them, so. It would be helpful if you'd be willing to maybe just keep in your mind, identify a few of those folks, maybe after crossover, when we finished with you know what we pass to the house we, we might have some time there to have them come in give us a sense of, of, of how they're teaching what they're teaching that could be really really interesting and always it's great to have students come in and talk to us that is you know, a big future difference. senator maybe yeah, we need, <laughs> yeah washington county right yeah first looks <laughs> thank you all very much thank good you. to see thank you appreciate thanks a million thank you. yeah appreciate it great work Ian, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Do you want to have a seat? So we have, uh, you know, roughly 25 minutes or so. Sure. We should and have a couple people signing on, too. So. Great. And we'll let you lead the discussion, um, or lead the sort of part of the conversation. Great. And you've read that chapter. Human sorry. rights commission? Is that what this is? Physical education. Uh, where is it right now? Hello. Pat? Yes. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. So, we've asked you here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had people in the committee, and then we were actually visited by Miss Vermont, uh, who has also raised some interesting questions around physical education and health education. And so, a couple of things just for you to think about to set the table for the conversation, I would say we'd like to know what physical education looks like in this space. How often are, are students getting it? Uh, I, for one, am a little concerned maybe they're not getting as much. Uh, love to know that. Health education also. We don't have to go through everything about health education, but one of the things that Ms. Vermont said that I thought was very interesting was what how can we use health education as a vehicle for young people to identify 
some of their struggles, mental health issues that they might be dealing with, and you know, just techniques, just acknowledging those mental health issues, trying to, to capture some of those mental health issues and getting them the assistance they need, knowing that they're not alone, and, and kind of what they might be feeling and thinking about is just also normal stuff, possibly. So uh, that is where we're at. So anything you can do to help us would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, the focus today is mostly oh, on we have some testimony. Great. physical education. Um, yeah. That I can that absolutely. Stop us from asking I was going to say, I can absolutely talk about, about health education. education. <laughs> yeah. uh, I am the, the, my name is Ian Barbarachari. Yes. Uh, I'm the health and physical education um, content specialist within the proficiency-based learning team within the Student Pathways Division at the Agency of Education. So Great. my background is in health education and physical education. Um, Before you start, yeah. was, uh, for the record, yes, Pat Simmons. I'm the proficiency-based learning team leader and Ian is one of the great members of my team. We're in Student Pathways and Ian has been working at the agency now for six months. All of six months. Okay. So. He's a rock star. Yeah. We're so yeah. lucky to have him. We'll see about that. Don't say that. Um, so I'm going to go right through. Oh. You're able to hear us too, Mark and myself. Yeah. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of kind of an overview of what the, it looks like across the state, looking at the statue, just kind of the basis for why do we have physical education in Vermont. Uh, we're joined by a participant or a physical educator who teaches at Floodbrook School, and then um, Lisa Cleveland, who is the um, physical education teacher education coordinator uh, at Castleton University. University or the Vermont System University. So they're going to be able to talk a little bit more about the practice and also some of the things that they're seeing in the field, but I can provide kind of an overview at the, at the state level and even, you know, looking at what does it look like across the different schools in Vermont because it does. So I did type something up. I'm going to read some of it. Um, so health and physical education as courses of study provides students with essential skills for healthy living after high school. Students that participate in physical education are almost twice as likely to maintain a healthy level of physical activity after graduation. Research also suggests that greater opportunities to engage in physical activity and physical education within the school day uh, are connected with student academic achievement, behavior management, overall health, uh, and also connected to school attendance. So, Physical education in Vermont supports student health in a context where student health needs have grown in many areas, which uh, we've in Vermont talked a little bit about. Based on 2019 Youth Behavior Risk Survey data, which that point group also mentioned, a quarter of Vermont high school students reported an overweight weight to height ratio. A quarter of high school students in the same survey also reported that they did not meet U.S. Department of Health physical activity recommendations, which is essentially just 60 minutes of physical activity a day. Um, LGBT students reported both lower rates of physical activity uh, and higher rates of obesity uh, than their other student counterparts. The growing health, mental health needs of students in Vermont have also been discussed here, um, and physical education is therefore important uh, for all Vermont students. So, overview, and then I can talk a little bit about what the Vermont State Statute and Board Rules says about that, and that provides a lot of the framework for how it actually is implemented in the state. Uh, so there are several statutes which provide direction to physical education practice. Uh, physical education is noted as a required course of study uh, in 16 BSA 906, just as English is. Uh, 16 BSA 136 provides further nuance uh, to what physical education should look like in the state as it defines physical education as a sequential, developmentally appropriate program that is an enjoyable experience for students and is designed to help students develop the knowledge, skill, self-management skill, attitudes, and confidence needed to adopt and maintain physical fitness throughout their lives. So how often does it happen? That's does that go district going, to district? That's or? going down here into the education. Okay. So the education quality standards. Um, so the paragraph below that talks a little bit about the tier systems of support within physical education, which are an important part and required by federal and state law. Uh, but Vermont State Board of Education, as written into EQS, also states each school shall provide students in grades K through 8 with at least two physical education classes per week. Each school shall provide students in grades 9 through 12 with one and one half years of physical education or the equivalent thereof. So that's what's in EQS. How does that compare to other states? That's a great question. I'll have to look into that. Okay. I mean, we can also, but if you would, it would be great if you would email Hayden Ross if you could. 
with sure. a sense of where we are. Um, in comparison, uh, absolutely. So, so again, so generally, two days a week? Were two days a week, K through eight. And these folks can probably talk a little bit about what that might look like in practice. Um, and week. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 50 minutes? That's, again, I would say okay. that it ranges. Yeah. Um, and I would suggest talking to some of the folks okay. that are in practice, because uh, yes, I think it ranges. I know it ranges. So what we have on this topic, sure. would one of you just let us know how often, so it sounds two times a week, but how many minutes are kids really getting some serious exercise? I'm looking at you, Mark. Yep, I can, gla I can gladly chime in. Uh, yes, so the, the mandate is two times weekly and I'm a K to eight health and PE teacher, um, but it is always, uh, it is based on the school schedule. So there's no time frame in that statute, which is the downfall. Right, I, I'm always striving to get my kids 60 minutes of exercise daily, but currently my schedule is 35 minute classes twice a week um, for my K to K to six or K to five kids. Sorry, and my six through eight kids see me uh, three times a week for 35 minutes, and that has fluctuated from as many as 45 minutes in my career here at Floodbrook. You know, so I've been here since 2005. Sometimes I've had them for 45 minutes. Sometimes I've had them for an hour. Sometimes I've had them for as short as 30 minutes. So because there's no time frame in that statute, it, it definitely leaves it up to the district's discretion. Um, and even within my own BRSU, I'm in the BRSU supervisory union, um, we're striving to get some consistency, but that has been hard for us as well. Um, we're trying to say within to our superintendent, we would at least like the kids being the same within our SU, but even within our own SU, we have timeframes all over the place. They're seeing them twice, we're seeing them twice a week, but that is it. So Mark, you've been at this for a while, almost 20 years, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, I've been in Vermont since 2005. I started teaching in 1997, so 25 years, sir. Yeah, so are you seeing greater obese, obesity issues or less, or can you just say something about that? Um, yeah, I don't know. If it's, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's just an objective question. I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it comes and goes, I guess it depends on the group of kids in the class and, and their upbringing, you know, it's, it, it there's a lot of factors that go into that. Right. Yeah. So, um, COVID has definitely been a hit for a lot of the kids. Um, I know, I, you know, I know, uh, like fitness testing is a, is a big question mark out there for a lot of people, but you know, that, that has been a great realization for my kids here because we've been doing it forever. It's part of what I do here. Um, those kids, the kids that have been doing it are where some of the, my best comments from kids have been like, holy cow, no exercise for one year is really impacted how many, like, you know, how well, how, how good my flexibility is, how well I can run. Um, so I think it was great for me to be doing that pre COVID. And then after COVID, it was awesome for those kids to come back to the gym and be like, holy cow, I'm out of shape. Um, so uh -huh. I, I think it goes back and forth between the two. Thank you. Senator Weeks. Just out of curiosity, um, are students ever evaluated for obesity, for, you know, formally? Is that, you know, is, is there ever a weight, uh, you know, body mass index review with students? Or is uh, that just not somewhere? Not, there? yeah, not within PE, not within my curriculum. Um, the, the we both most of it has been through the you know our physicals that we have kids get through the pediatrician so we 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 have that within our school um, umbrella that that is done via pediatrician. Um, okay, very good. That that answers the question. So, that, so our our nurse our nurse holds all that data then so she collects that and has that. Um, so I see that like I I have access to it but it's not part of something that I do within PE as far as measuring that in PE. We talk about it, but we don't actually measure it. Thank you. Yes, and so, thank you, Mark, for that. Um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about some of the kind of overall trends. So if you turn to this lovely page, there's some below points out. Uh, some statistics that come from a variety of sources, the Vermont Agency of Education, Vermont Department of Health, U.S. Department of Education, um, and these are related mostly to public schools. Um, so just not to read every single one, but pulling out a couple things of importance. Uh, in 2020, three quarters of Vermont schools require physical education teachers to follow a written physical education curriculum. 
Also in 2020, nearly half allow for the use of waivers, exemptions, or substitutions for physical education requirements. Um, looking at school improvement plans, so this data is also from 2020. Um, although it's increased the level that health education and physical activity are built into school improvement plans, we saw a noticeable dip between 2018 and 2020, um, meaning that physical education goals are less included within school improvement plans as they were in 2018 to 2020. Um, and also looking at the teacher level, in both 2020 and 2021, uh, there's been a statewide shortage of physical education teachers in Vermont. Uh, in 2021, there were 19 physical educators granted first year provisional or emergency licenses to teach in the state. Um, and then you can look at kind of at this back page. This is just a breakdown of different courses that are offered um, and attendance within them. So there is a range of courses that exist. Um, and these are PE credit like courses. So, um, and actually I was going to hand over my time to these folks who, as I said, six months, but also lots of experience up here um, to, to talk a little bit about the preparation part as well as the what it looks like in practice. And did you want to add anything before we close? I'm good. Thank you, okay. Chris. Right. Yeah. Okay. I guess uh, that's my cue then. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry I'm appearing on Zoom. Um, but it's been a busy time here at Castleton, especially given the library closures and the, the nutty stuff going on here. So I'm happy to talk about physical education. And likewise, if you have health education questions, I could probably um, answer those as well. This is my 19th year here at Castleton. Um, again, as Ian mentioned, I'm the teacher education coordinator here. I oversee the preparation of our students who are going to become teachers, not only in Vermont, but whatever other state they travel back to. And right now, a lot of them are traveling back to home states. They are not staying in Vermont. Uh, we place the majority of our students in Vermont schools. Uh, we also, though, have a typical number of maybe a quarter um, every year that we place in New York schools as well. Uh, I know probably two thirds of the physical ed educators in Vermont. They've either come through my program or I know them through other professional organizations. So I am literally in the schools watching what's going on. My student teachers are in the schools telling me what's going on. And we're doing the training to try to um, improve the quality of physical education as well as health ed education in our schools. Um, my Probably the biggest takeaway I can give you today is the um, inequity I see in schools across the state where we have teachers that are highly qualified, teachers that are struggling, teachers that um, do not have the time to teach their students. Um, in Rutland, where Senator Weeks and, and Senator Williams, your, your kindergartners are getting one day a week by one of the best teachers I know because that's what they're allotted. And I know that time is precious and you know, there, there's a lot that goes on in schools but the, the intent of providing quality daily physical activity um, is really tough when students aren't becoming um, physically educated to want to be physically active beyond the PE class. And that's really what a successful PE class is. We tell our, our teacher candidates, it's not what you're doing in your class, it's what they're taking from your class and what the kids are doing beyond your classroom time. That's when you know you're successful. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have about teacher preparation or um, physical education or health education in general in, in Vermont. Well, that was very helpful just to know that there are kindergartners out there that are just getting that one day. And we're really talking, could be 20 minutes. And you know, from where I'm sitting, it, it's, it's, it's great socialization. It's great, you know, post-COVID, like Mark said, you know, getting back into the, you know, the physical act part of life. And so, you know, frankly, it's just, just disappointing. So I, I think one of the things we can learn from the agency is whether or not, well, I guess maybe start with you, Lisa. What is this hitting up against? What is it when a kindergartner is only getting 20 minutes a week 
what's happening there is are people just saying we, we can't find the time because the kids have to be doing what can you help us with that that's what I hear from my teachers in the field. Um, we're not getting okay. the time because there is so much other, um, so much other stuff going on in schools, okay. and you know it's all valuable. It's all valuable yeah. time. Yeah. So the the new role I, I think that physical educators are, are really trying to take on in schools as well is addressing the social emotional needs of our of our our youth. Um, we're trying to train our teacher educators to address those SEL um, outcomes. You know, it's it's not about we need to be competitive in sport. It's about let's figure out how we're going to have students self-regulate and not get um, anxious or angry at one another. And, and so trying to modify our curriculum to meet the needs of current students. Um, but again, if, if students aren't getting the time to practice those skills, to learn those skills, then um, the preparation doesn't matter here. Oh yes, please. All right. okay. Yeah, I got. I mean, if I could. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to piggyback on that, if you don't mind. We just have a question, and then and then we'll we'll uh, go to you, Mark. Well, this may be a okay. big this may be a big one that's not really answerable, but. Um, I do, I have heard, and I think other countries espouse this notion of um, more academic work doesn't necessarily mean better academic outcomes, and that there is a place where more structured play and physical activity actually will lead to more learning. And uh, you, again, like you don't need to give me any data around that, but it is an interesting concept, and I guess I'm interested in learning more about yeah. that as we talk about this. That that's a, a great point, um, Senator Gould. Look, it, it, the data has been out there for twenty years, and again, I think that data is going to shift now more towards social emotional outcomes, given what we experienced through the pandemic and what the the additional needs of students are now. But you're right on target. The the academic um, benefits for quality physical activity are there. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak here. Uh, Senator Williams has a question. So what I'm hearing is, uh, you know, we have a shortage of PE teachers. And Absolutely. there is it the administration is deciding that PE takes a backseat to other learning needs. And I've also seen school buses going by my place in my town at 245. So how do we put it all into one day? Do we do we ex expand the, the day for the educators and the, and the students? So as far as the, yeah. the shortage in teachers right now, um, pre-COVID, again, this is my perception. I'm the person that writes recommendations for students to get jobs. It was a competitive market. Schools weren't hiring as many teachers. Teachers are staying longer in their jobs. School districts were taking physical educators and splitting them between schools or hiring them as a 0.5 or a 0.8. You know, this this weird system where you're not a whole professional during the day, you're a 0.8 professional. Right. Uh, COVID saw, just like other content areas, a plethora of teachers retiring and leaving early. And I've told my students, you are in the best job market you'll ever be in. That being said, we're not keeping up with supporting our students here to finish student teaching. Um, they find that it's it's not what it's cracked up to be. It's hard. We're, they're seeing violence in schools. Kids are fighting. They recognize they're not being supported as physical educators. And they say, I'm, I'm going to go into a different career. Um, so th the other thing that's happened over the last 10 years there's really two physical education programs left in the state, Norwich and us, Castleton. Uh, UVM, they're teaching out right now, so they're not accepting any new students and most of their grads left the state. Norwich, because of the nature of Norwich's program, a lot of their students leave the state. Those that stay, they're, they're wonderful, they're highly qualified. And as I mentioned, about a, you know, a quarter of ours were already placing New York. They're, they're not coming back to, connect, to um, Vermont to work where they can get better pay um, or better support. That's so. I, I I'm optimistic 
about coming out of COVID and the cohort of students we have coming up. But right now we definitely are in like this weird place where there's there's nobody available. There's there's no one taking jobs. I literally two hours ago had one of my former students asking me, I'm going on maternity leave. Do you have anybody that can take my spot for six months? And I'm like, they're already gone. So. Mark. So yeah, I got sorry, I got a bunch of notes on all of that. Perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I, I could chime in just follow Lisa on the, the the tidbit of just the teachers, right? Like we we had a great pro, we have a great program at Floodbrook, right? We have a full-time PE teacher, we have a full-time health person, we have a full-time guidance counselor, we have a full-time social worker. Like we are we are ready for all of it, right? Um our 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 program was so good that our supervisory union one it has duplicated it across the school, you know, across our SU. So our health teacher moved to another school that was closer to her, right? She was awesome. She was here for eight years. She was a Castleton grad, right? We just recently replaced her. So it's been a year and a half to try to find a health teacher to replace her. Therefore, all of that work not in a bad way, sort of got kicked back to me where I'm teaching both health and PE, cramming it into my schedule, right? Um, luckily, we found someone that is, you know, going to be here to teach, right? So it's one of these things of like, for us, it was we were doing a great job. Everybody recognized we were doing a great job. They duplicated what we're doing across our whole SU. And now we lost one of our great, great teachers. She's still with us. She's just in a different building, right? So, so that, that's one piece of that, right? I agree with the structured play piece, right? The, one of my greatest comments I get from middle school kids all the time is they wanna get rid of recess and have more PE. They wanna be with the PE teacher doing structured activity, going hiking, snowshoeing, playing volleyball in a structured fashion as opposed to recess, right? I have way less discipline problems while I have them structured and doing something as opposed to out at recess. So that's sort of dealing with that recess question a little bit and structured play. Um, and then back even further, you know, someone's comment about just time frame, right? We have, if I see the kids twice weekly, which is the state mandate right now, 30 minutes, there's only 36 weeks in a school year. That's 36 hours. I only see the kids for 36 hours for physical education within a school year. Sometimes that resonates with parents about how little I actually see them. Like 36 hours is not much time for me to spend with them throughout a school year. Now, how I've countered this a little bit is I definitely have taken stuff out of my classroom, right? So I've gotten snowshoe, I got a grant for snowshoes. I've assigned those to a classroom, right? There's a classroom teacher that takes the kids snowshoeing instead of me. So I'm getting them active elsewhere. Right. I started with COVID. I started we started sending home gear in my SU. So instead of the kids, if we're doing jump roping in class, I'm sending a jump rope home for the kids. So my budget and some grant money and some local, you know, finance people here are seeing value in that. So if I'm playing soccer, we're buying a soccer ball for every kid in our school, you know, in kindergarten. And they have a soccer ball so that they can actually play. Um, so I just got a grant for cross country skis, you know, so I have a great two, two classrooms that have enough cross country skis to go cross country skiing. And I've trained them in PE class. And now the classroom teacher is just taking them out and they're doing that instead of recess. They're going cross country skiing, right? So there's sort of ways around it, but you know, again, that's depends on the PE teacher as well, right? That's my passion. So I'm very proactive in that aspect, you know, uh, other PE teachers might not be as proactive as I am. Um, so I'm just trying to have a great program here and keep that rolling, right? I have to fight every year to keep my health teacher, to keep my full-time guidance counselor, to keep my full-time social worker, right? Those are constant things that are on the chopping block, but they are people that are needed here to keep this place running smoothly. Sorry, so that was a lot. You know, that, was, that, was, that was getting to everybody's little tidbits as I was taking notes. Thank you. We appreciate that you have the fire in your bellies. We really do. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I mean that. And I'm going to ask Ian, would yeah. you mind coming back in two weeks? Aiden will arrange it. And, and of course, Pat, you're more than welcome to join. Yeah, I like to just sit here. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody come back in two weeks. Yeah. 
I'd like to know this comparison between other states. Sure. And I'd like to, to know if you want if you can make the case for more physical education in this state. I mean, some kind of greater mandate. You know, behavior issues, I'm not an expert, you know, but it just seems to me that a lot of this stuff is popping up and could be addressed perhaps and you know, listen, somebody could write Sam way off, but physical activity is so important. For all of us, we all feel more relaxed, I think, calmer if we get out and have that kind of physical activity, right? So, yes. So, I was a kindergarten teacher for many years, yeah. and I just want to say that 30 minutes includes your transition to right. gym yeah. no, and leaving. So, uh, it's yeah. not really 30 minutes, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I want to say, I think I'm getting her name right, Robin Newton from Virginia, yes, sir. the um, PE Teacher of the Year. She oh, has an amazing teacher. program, or the Teacher of the Year, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, she has a really interesting program that connects the brain, physical activities, and academics. Mm -hmm. So she is someone I think you would really like we to talk about. We talked about getting her in. Yeah, yeah. And, I think the agency mentioned. So maybe in June, yes, yes, everybody yes. should come back yes. for, you know, just have this conversation. Should sure. we be mandating more? And I, I appreciate, Mark, really very much that, you know, you're getting kids on cross-country skis and snowshoes. You know, some kid leaves Vermont and you kind of expect that kid to know how to cross-country ski, snowshoe, and have some kind of experience, if, if we can give it to them. So the other piece of this is what does the agency look like around grants and things like that to make sure that those kinds, that kind of, equipment. I kind of think of it, I'm sure everybody is, skills for life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, my brother loved lacrosse, but he's not going out with a lacrosse stick anymore. And is it, you know, but you do play golf forever, ski, you know, you still throw the lacrosse ball around with the kids, I get that. But, you know, what are those things that we can do so that people do it for life? Yeah. Skiing what is what made my college decision yeah. <laughs> to go to UVM. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the best way to make a decision, but it's Well, Pat, uh, you know, I agree that might not have been the best way on the side. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I can definitely bring some more data and kind of assess of what's currently happening. Um, obviously, we're not in the legislative business of making policies or suggestions on that nature, but I can definitely gather some data that right, would be right. helpful for if you want to make a making you a decision. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. State yeah. employer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Yeah. Great to see you. Yes, thank you. Really appreciate thank you, it. Look forward to maybe seeing you again in a couple thank of weeks. You. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome to come visit at any time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. You're, Same you're, here. You're down. Love to have you on too, campus. Too. You be yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. It's so nice to be back in person. Yes, say. yes. We'll it is it wonderful, though, that you have the videos for people to look yes. at later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I've enjoyed looking at some of the testimony and learning what people are thinking. So thank That's you great. for doing that. I go back and look at them, too. <laughs> so yeah. I. Yeah. I, I miss a lot. Are you checking to see how you looked in the video? No. <laughs> no, 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 I don't worry about that. Yeah, it's just, it's just, that's my priority. This angle is like a little, yeah, we got to the top camera a little bit. <laughs> All right, thank you, well, so thank much. you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We're adjourned for the day. We look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow.